Walter August Jr., the senior pastor of our church at Bethel's family. Thank you for tuning in. You're about to hear a special message that God has laid on our heart for the body of Christ, including myself. So sit back, get your Bible, get your pen, enjoy this message, and I know God's going to bless you tremendously. Thank you again, and God to bless us. you. Family, I want us to focus in, if you don't mind, even on that noon they are, where we focused in on uh, the title of church folks sticking together. Church folks sticking together. It is something that we have to continue to struggle with in the area of people not being able to stick together the way they should and still reeling and coming off of Dr. King's holiday on Monday. I think that was one of his phrase to the leaders in the spiritual world that in order to accomplish great things, you have to stick together. You have to stick together. How many of you have witnessed disunity, whether it's in your own family? Isn't that painful when you watch people who say they love the Lord not even getting along with one another? Doesn't it pain you in your heart when you see friction and fractions, even among siblings and children? Somehow they get mad with one another for whatever reason and then they decide they're not going to speak to each other again. Isn't that crazy? And sometimes this thing move into our homes amongst husband and wives, children in the middle of that, and spirit of anger rise in, and anger and frustration and things are said. But tonight, I want us to focus in on the essence of church folks. Now, I must give you a definition of church folks. <laughs> Not church goers, but church folks. Jesus says in Matthew 16 and 18, upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Church folks are those who have given themselves to the Almighty God. Church folks are those who have surrendered to the call of Christ over their lives. Church folks are the ones that say, I am going and on my way to heaven. Church folks understand that Calvary was a victory for them. Church folks acknowledge that Jesus hung, bled, and died for their sins. Church folks believe that he was placed in the borrowed tomb and on the third day morning rose with all power in heaven and on earth. Church folks, church folks believe that there's nothing more important in their life than communing with God. Church folks, church folks don't let nothing come between them and their relationship with God. Church folks. And family, I must share with you, there is a difference in church attenders and just church folks. The world, based on its own definition, does not have the heart to stick together. And that's why you have so much friction, so much enmity, so much confusion and divisions that's in this world. That's why we move from uh, racism to classism to uh, you in poverty, you in middle class or wealth class. Why can't they just be the people and have all things in common because God is God and we're his children. And then we also understand because of some levels of pigmentation, some are treated better than others. Then some are more welcome because of their financial situation than those that have not the means. But I come by to tell you, when we look at the glue, the poxy, the adhesive that hold individuals together to have them stick together, it's a substance called love. If you look there on your sermon card, we're going to walk tonight if you don't mind. I pray you don't mind walking. Some areas we might run, but we're going to do a lot of walking tonight. 
because we got to go ahead and belay the point that church folks need to stick together. Church folks need to stick together. It says there in scripture, John 13, 35, it says, by this, everyone who will know, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You ought to underline love. Love is glue. Love is the adhesive. Love is the epoxy that binds all things together. The earlier verses in this same text deal with Peter asking Christ, how will men know we belong to you? You're talking about leaving us, resurrecting, going back to your father. How will people know that we belong to you? And Jesus says they, know, they will know that you are my disciples because you're going to love one another. And why is it so important, Rev, for folks to love each other? Because you cannot stick with nobody you don't love. Boy, I'm about to say something, but I better leave that alone. Let me get my mind right there, but lucky. You can do the reverse of that, but you can't do you cannot stick with people you don't love. You cannot do it. No matter who you are, if you don't love a person, you cannot stick with them. And then this love I'm talking about family is not an erotic, romantic, type of feeling, type of philia, type of love. I'm not talking about that kind of love. I'm talking about a love that comes from God. This love has no rules. It has no boundaries. This love has no expiration date. This love, love in spite of who you are. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 8, it says, Christ demonstrated his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. The love that God gives to us is not predicated on us. It's predicated on God's grace, his mercy. And out of being followers of Jesus Christ, our love for one another need to be evident if we say we love God. Now, many say they love God and the Bible comes in. How can you say you love God and you can't love your brothers and your sisters who you see every day? And just because there might be a couple of you might not be familiar, let me just go in sidebar just momentarily. The love chapter is Romans chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you don't mind, I want to sidebar and go there because the Bible says, I'm paraphrasing right now, you can be the greatest singer, you can be the best prayer warrior, you can give the most money at the church. I mean, you could usher in every position in the church, but if you have no love in your heart, the Bible say it's all for naught. You're wasting your time. Let me give you this according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want you to have this because it's important of you to put it in your pocket. Amen? In, in verse 4 of that particular chapter, here's what it says, family. It says very candidly something about love. It says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love delight, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. And watch this, love always protects, love always trusts, always hopes always persevere love never fails in verse 13 it says these three remain faith hope and love and the greatest of these is love we might as well close the bible study right now if you're not going to cross over this love bridge 
If you find yourself struggling right now, I can't love this person, I can't love that person, you don't, that person did this, that. if you can't cross this bridge, listen, your Bible study has just stopped right here. No need to go, just, cl just close the word up and just put your Bible right there and go to sleep. Because you can't move forward until you graduate in this love thing. We're living in a time where those who say they love the Lord, church folks ought to understand when you love the Lord, you love the way God has commanded you to love. Listen, I can love you and still not accept everything you do. Amen. My love for you and your love for me is not predicated on what we do. Because some of us, we crazy. Just look at your neighbor and say, yeah. <laughs> Amen. But it's not predicated on the things you do. We have to love the way God loved because he has commanded that that is the epoxy. That's the glue. That's how men will know you love God, you love others. If you struggle with this love, if you're flunking in this category, you're not going to, amen, allow yourself to be used greatly by God. And watch this. If you don't love individuals the way you're supposed to love them, the Bible is true. That which a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if you're not loving them, then you hate and own them. I don't hate them, I just don't love them. Well, the opposite of love is hate. There ain't no little something in the middle. You either love them or you hate them. Now, these are times when the body of Christ and those who call on the name of Jesus need to fully graduate to understand that we love in spite of. This is how you get your diploma in the kingdom. This is a class. This is, family, this is not an elective. This is a required course. You've got to pass this one. You can't pass this one with a D. You only get an A or F. There's no B, there's no C, there's no D. You get an A or an F. You either pass or fail when it comes to love. Because some of us try to warm up to love people. Listen, the, what the world need now is love, sweet love. Just, a, that's what the world needs, a little love. You will start seeing people change when love become permanent. A lot of people don't say I love you. But also, it has to have actions behind it. Because someone say, you know, words are cheap. You got to put love into action. Now, let me help build a case before we lose some of it. Now, is anybody in here cannot cross this bridge called love? If you cannot cross this bridge called love, it's okay. I just want you to get in, get in the choir stand. If you're going to struggle loving people, just get in the choir stand. And maybe the one you're struggling with loving might be watching you. This is serious business. You've got to cross this love bridge. You've got to graduate. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what they said. It doesn't matter what they've done because you've done some stuff too. You follow me? Does anybody want to get up here? Y'all thinking about it? I'll come back to that. Now I want you to really walk with me to understand that church folks sticking together, and it doesn't matter whether the church folks are at Bethel 
or whether they're at Windsor or whether at Brentwood or whether at St. Stephen's Church or whether they're at Lakewood or whether they're at Sugar Creek or Bear Creek or, or whether they're at Fort Bend or whether they're at Harvest Point. Uh, I'm trying to help somebody here, whether in St. Mary, uh, church folks ought to stick together. You're battling the same demon. And there's only one church. And that church belonged to Christ Jesus. Church folks ought to stick together. Forget about denominationalism. Because when you get to heaven, don't go up there and say, where, where, where are all the Baptists? There is no Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Seventh-day Adventist. God don't do that. Man did that. Because over in the book of Ephesians, let's just go there if you don't mind, family. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says, And for this reason, Paul says, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. Paul says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. Paul remembered them at Ephesus because of their great love for God's people. Family, believe it or not, people are watching you when you're not watching you. Most of us don't realize that people are watching us when we are not watching them. That's not a place you can go where somebody can't see you. Even if you're in your home all by yourself, God sees you. And you have to realize, family, there is a recording of your life on this side. But that's with God. Paul was excited to give the church at Ephesus such great report and, 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 and commend them on their love for God's people. One might say, well, I, I love everybody. Do you really? How many of you love some white folks? I don't see all the hands. How many of you love Hispanics and Asians? How many of you have some white friends? When are you going to invite them to church? <laughs> Keep inviting them. Invite your Asian friends, Hispanic friends. I'm sharing this with you, Sam. The way you tackle this issue in our land of racism is that the love that you have is for all people. Pastor August can't preach a black gospel. If my preaching only work with black folks, then it's not from God. The gospel goes out to all people. And just like the gospel goes out to all people, so should your love. And Paul was excited when he saw the folks at Ephesus the way they loved God's people. Wow. You don't have it in your particular text, but I'm going to give you the other part because I want to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Because I want you to know that God is not going to keep you and God is not going to force you to love. 
Love have to be your choice. It's your choice to love. Paul says in chapter four of Ephesians says, listen, as a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received from God. In the King James Version, it says, I beseech ye by the by prison of the Lord that, I, that you walk worthy of the vocation by which you've been called. You and I have been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. And then he says something else. He says in verse two, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And then he says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And here's the reason why you don't have it there, but verse four of the same text says this, because there is only one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the one hope when you were called, there's one Lord, there's one faith, one baptism, one God, the father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There's only one God. There's only one faith. There's only one baptism. And it's the Father that's in all and through all. And so God has the capacity to love all of us. And our job is to go back and walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. There must be transformation. There must be something that happens in your life that changes you. The old song that I truly love when they sing it, I know I've been changed. Hmm. That's a powerful testimony right there, y'all. I know I've been changed. Amen. When you think about the lyrics of that song and the power that's in that song, when that person sang that song for the very first time, they had what we call a Damascus Road experience where their name was changed and God did a work inside of their heart and that which they used to do just don't have a desire to do it no more. There's been a change more in Ephesians chapter four, it says the old things have passed away. All things become new. There need to be a transformation in your heart. The worst thing to do, family, is to live your life in not love. So where, why does people walk around with all this meanness? And I'm talking about some church folks. Let me ask you a question. If you were really on trial and they brought up the charge against you concerning loving, is there enough evidence to convict you? If your life depended on evidence that can be presented that you really love, is there enough evidence to save your life? And family, I must share with you, when Paul speaks, he says you have to make every effort, you got to use every ounce of resources to keep the unity of the bond in the spirit of peace. You got to use everything you have. 
church folks sticking together. Now I'm about to throw a monkey on the line. Already got some of you thinking about the choir stand. Not only in order to stick together, there's another one that hangs right with love because they ride together. Look at your next set of Texas. Part of being humble and gentle and patient and bearing one another in love has to do with Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which bind them all together in perfect unity. Hmm. Rev, listen. I'm, I was still struggling with that love thing. And now you added some more scriptures to this thing. Now in the middle of that, now you want me to forgive too. Well, Reb don't want you to forgive. God commanded that you forgive. The worst thing to do, my brothers and sisters, is to live and die with an unforgiving heart. to live and die with an unforgiving heart. Family, hell is real. Hell is real, like the nose on your face. To not forgive well, let's look at the next set of scriptures. It, it says there for, my back, why won't you read it? It might stick. Y'all ready? One, two, and three. Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. Why don't you go? How many of you are going to struggle with that? It's okay to raise your hand. It's okay to raise your hand. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have you come to the choir stand. But I do believe in the power of prayer. And there are things that we need to get delivered from. To not forgive will hinder God from forgiving you. And you risk your future in the kingdom. One of the easiest ways to process forgiveness is to walk in Jesus' shoes for an hour. If you, if you remember, when Jesus walked this earth, there were some very cruel men who tormented our Savior. And we're talking about Jesus who had no sin in his life. 
They whipped him through the streets. They paraded him through town. And when the Roman soldiers were beating him with these straps, they had little pieces of rocks and metals in the strands. And every time they would hit him, they would yank back and that would pull flesh off his body. And then him carrying his own cross, then nailing him to the cross, hanging him up. If you can imagine the excruciating pain of having to have your whole weight being placed on the ligaments and the bone fractures in your body, hanging on that cross, dying as an innocent man. But he said something, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Most of the people that hurt you or harm you, they really don't know you. And out of their own ignorance of their own pain, hurting people go around hurting people. And so you really have to get yourself in a position where you say, God, I don't want to die with an unforgiving heart. Because an unforgiving heart will eat at you like cancer. And it will tear into you and make you numb on the inside. You will not be able to even experience the joy of the Lord right in the midst of your face. And if you have an unforgiving heart, you will never ever see the real good in yourself or other people. An unforgiving heart, you will see the bad in everything. And you'll walk around with a countenance more of a sour puss like you've been sucking on lemons every day. And when you have an unforgiving heart, people don't want to be around you because you're negative. And there is nothing positive that come out of your mouth. If you die with an unforgiving heart, you place yourself in jeopardy of not experiencing the kingdom of God because God's going to say you had an opportunity to forgive your brother or your sister, but you chose not to. Matter of fact, Jesus is going to say, God's going to say, you promoted yourself to my chair and I have never promoted anybody equal to my son. And if my son can forgive, Why are you holding all these rocks? Many of us find doors stay closed because of our heart of unforgiveness. Many of us are in health crisis because of unforgiving hearts. Family, you've got to learn to release people so you can live. And you don't do it so they can prosper. You do it so you can grow. You do it so you can live and you can sleep and you can rest because here's the crazy thing. You're caught up with an unforgiving heart and these people have made their peace with God and they have moved on and here you are still stuck on stupid. Your lives have stopped and stalled because you chose to make it the place where you will live. Matter of fact, you haven't even had real joy since 1982. Because you, you refuse to forgive, to love. There's not a person in here who have not been wounded by something. And some of us been wounded more than once. But I am so thankful that I've learned to give God what I can't handle. I've learned how to give it to God what I can't control. 
When that song came out, you know, the battle is not mine. It is the Lord. Let me sidebar to help somebody. Over in the book of Romans chapter 12. Because church folks sticking together, you got to do Bible. You, you must do the Bible. And it has nothing to do with how you feel. In chapter 12 of Romans, starting there at verse 17, here's what Paul says. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, say the Lord and not you. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hmm. Look at your neighbor and say, that's Bible. Deacon White, you may have to help me. Uh, the movie we watch, or I tell people to watch that day, that happened, the story that happened in uh, Richmond, Rosemary, Fuchsia area. It was a Texas what now? You remember the name of it? Honey, you remember? It'll come to me shortly, but this is a true story that happened that might can help some of you in the area of getting a forgiving heart. And I think it dealt with the story of the heart of Texas. I think that was the name of it, the heart of Texas. Over in the Fort Bend County, Forsha area, this one man who happened to be white his family, two children, and he flew planes and had a business, a company, doing well for himself. But somehow he befriended an older black gentleman. The black gentleman's name was Ulysses. And it says, the story goes on that he had become such good friends with Ulysses that Ulysses' family was struggling. He had a little house, but you know, the house was not modern. And so he had it in his heart that he was going to eventually build Ulysses a house. The story goes on to say that one night his wife had taken the kids into town whether to eat or I think a soccer game or something. And on their way back, headed home, uh, the little girl told her mom, mom, I got to use the restroom and I got to use it now. And so she was about five years old. And so the mother pulled on the side of the road and the little girl didn't wait, got out of the van and ran right in the midst of traffic. A truck came and hit the little girl and killed her, but didn't stop. Story goes to say that, of course, you got uh, DPS, you got the law enforcement, Fort Ben Shell. Everybody's trying to find this particular person who had ended up running over this little girl and killing her. 
Story goes to say that the sheriff, somebody was in town and saw a truck that had a little damage on it. And one thing led to another and the DNA matched that of the little girls on the truck. The truck happened to belong to Ulysses. The father of that little girl, that was his friend that had killed his daughter. Ulysses said, I remember it was dark. I remember hitting something in the road, but it didn't dawn on me what it was. This father decided to go to Ulysses' house and picked he and his wife up and took them to a store and bought them some clothes so they can come attend their child's funeral. And they were not just in the audience of the church sitting in the back. This gentleman had his wife on his left side and he placed Ulysses right next to him. And Ulysses' wife. This man relationship with the Lord God was doing something in his heart. His wife was struggling. His son was struggling with it. Community like that, you know, it can easily go racial pretty quickly. But he didn't allow that to get in his skin. Story goes on to say that he went to his pastor, the gentleman, the white gentleman, and said, I, I know I'm being compelled to fulfill a promise that I had made Ulysses to build him a new house. And I need the church to help me. If you can imagine family in a small community like that, the pastor, he was saying, you know, even I was struggling. Long story short, somehow the community came together and built Ulysses and his wife a new house. When you get a chance, look it up for yourself and look at the documentary, it's about an hour and 10 minutes long. It gives you the complete story. And most of us, the things that we hold in our heart to not forgive somebody has nothing to do at that gravity or that level. It's stuff that people roll their eyes at you. People talked about your mama. People curse you out. People stole an outfit from you. They took your doll. They stole some money from you. They lied on you and got you fired from your job. You talking about pen, penny any things. Try having someone responsible for killing your five-year-old child. And then your faith is now tested to love them. And not just say you love it, but demonstrate that love. You got to cross that bridge of forgiveness. You have to do that because it will kill you if you don't. But please, ma'am, before the weekend or this weekend, look up that movie, sit there and embrace it and see the powerful testimony of how that man defiled his wife, his friends, the people in the city to do the love and the forgiveness thing that Jesus has said we need to do. And so love and forgiveness, they ride together. Sticking together means you're able to forgive people who have wronged you. Because when you hold a grudge against somebody else, then God says, matter of fact, let me just give it to you the way it is. You read it. It says, but for if you forgive 
other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others for their sin, then your Father will not forgive you for your sins. And listen, if your sins are not forgiven, sinful people cannot make it into the kingdom of God. Your sins have to be forgiven and you have to be cleansed. Now watch how crazy this is. The people that you need to forgive have moved on with their life and walking upright with God. They're on their way to heaven and you will forfeit your ticket. You will forfeit your ticket. And I got to go deeper here because you have to realize if you're struggling with forgiveness and you're struggling with loving, the very people, kids, grandkids, nieces and nephews watching you, they will also be impacted. And the Bible says if you lead any of these little ones astray, it'll be best you put a millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the lake. Many times we put that spirit on our children and we put it on our grandchildren because you got mad with somebody. You have transplanted that next generation of kids to dislike the very people that you don't like. And you say that's just who we are. That's how racism have lived so long because it was bred in generation from generation. The curse of the fathers can be passed on to the third and fourth generation. That which you do can be passed on to future generations. And you know who's going to, amen, be responsible for that. I do believe, family, in my heart of hearts, the things we're seeing in the rebellious spirit of our young people, we are actually living out the failure in the sins of grandfathers and great grandfathers when they did not do it right now. It's coming back up. Bible says God word would not come back void. That's why we got to, as parents, as people of God sticking together, we got to make sure that we got to clean up where we messed up. We got to go to God and say, God, I don't want to talk about nobody right now, God, but I want you to talk to me. And some of us really need to get naked before God and get naked in the mirror. And so God and you can look at each other. And the reason why you look into the mirror to see what's messed up on you. And when you dress, when you get naked before the Lord, then you put on those things that God want you to put on and they listed right there in front of you. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, long suffering. You put those things on compassion and kindness. You put those things on and then you will be equipped to live. Because if you struggle forgiving other people, your list will only get larger. Because you will become so accustomed to not forgiving. Forgiving won't even register. Family, don't you know it only takes 90 days for you to do something consecutively, repetitiously, before it becomes a habit? We all have to forgive people. We all have to forgive people. We all have to forgive people. Yeah, you too. Yeah, mm -hmm, you too. Mm -hmm, you too. Yeah, you too. Mm -hmm, that's right, you too. We all have to forgive people. Let me ride this thing to a close because I want to give you something because if you can see what's written in Romans chapter 1 verse 29, 30 and 31, these are the very same things you have to begin to forgive people for. When those that walk around with a hard heart, 
those who refuse to allow God to have their heart. Then in Romans chapter one, this is right after the text when it says, because of the hardening of their heart, gave, God gave them up to a, a reprobated mind. And when you get a reprobated mind, my brother, my sister, because of the hardness of your heart, then here's what you do. It says they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders, God haters, insolent. They're arrogant and boastful. Look at this, they invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents and they have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. We have to go back in and continue to ask God to examine us. The best way to examine yourself is just get naked before the Lord. And it's not taking your clothes off, but really coming before the Lord with all of your stuff right here. See, we can go ahead and fake and fool each other for a while. But my brother, my sister, you not I can fake and fool God. He's an x-ray of life. He could see everything in you. He knows your every thought. Every word that rolled out of your mouth, he knew it before it hit the air. He knows your motivation. He knows your intentions. Someone say, well, God know all that. Why don't he stop me from doing this crazy stuff? God has given you a free will. And the choices are up to you. It's just like what we tell with our kids. Your decisions will have consequences. And most of us, if we are honest, we're doing this stuff in full understanding what we're doing. So my brother and sister, you got to make sure that if church folks going to stick together, and be together, you have to love people. I don't have to love what you're doing, but I still have to love you. So those men who love men, we love them. We don't like what they do. Those women who hanging out with women, we love them, but we don't like what they do. These brothers who gang banging and stealing and raping and murdering, we love them. We don't like what they are doing. It's like our children family. No matter what our children do, it doesn't eradicate our love for them. It breaks our hearts, but we don't stop loving them. You hear what I'm saying? Love is of God. It's important that you be known as a person that loves. If you truly struggle with this love, with this forgiveness, I want to pray for you. And I want to pray for you for real. Because I don't want to be your pastor and you in this church and you live with an unforgiving heart. That's not what God is desiring. What an awesome message God has provided for us. I know you've been helped. And I just want to, if you want to contact us or call us or even support the ministry, it's Bethel's Family Baptist Church, P.O. Box 35818, Houston, Texas, 77235. God bless you, love you, and we look forward to seeing you again real soon.